The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 7 The Guest. When Phoebe awoke, which she did with the early twittering of the conjugal couple of robins in the pear tree, she heard movements below stairs and, hastening down, found Hepzibah already in the kitchen. She stood by a window, holding a book in close contiguity to her nose, as if with the hope of gaining an olfactory acquaintance with its contents, since her imperfect vision made it not very easy to read them. If any volume could have manifested its essential wisdom in the mode suggested, it would certainly have been the one now in Hepzibah's hand, and the kitchen in such an event would forthwith have steamed with the fragrance of venison, turkeys, capons, larded partridges, puddings, cakes, and Christmas pies in all manner of elaborate mixture and concoction. It was a cookery book, full of unnumerable old fashions of English dishes and illustrated with engravings which represented the arrangements of the table at such banquets as it might have befitted a nobleman to give in the great hall of his castle. And... Amid these rich and potent devices of the culinary art, not one of which probably had been tested within the memory of any man's grandfather, poor Hepzibah was seeking for some nimble little tidbit which, with what skill she had and such materials as were at hand, she might toss up for breakfast. Soon, with a deep sigh, she put aside the savory volume and inquired of Phoebe whether old Speckle, as she called one of the hens, had laid an egg the preceding day. Phoebe ran to see, but returned without the expected treasure in her hand. At that instant, however, the blast of a fish dealer's conch was heard announcing his approach along the street. With energetic raps at the shop window, Hepzibah summoned the man in and made purchase of what he warranted as the finest mackerel in his cart, and as fat a one as ever he felt with his finger so early in the season. Requesting Phoebe to roast some coffee, which she casually observed was the real mocha, and so long kept that each of the small berries ought to be worth its weight in gold, the maiden lady heaped fuel into the vast receptacle of the ancient fireplace in such quantity as soon to drive the lingering dusk out of the kitchen. The country girl, willing to give her utmost assistance, proposed to make an Indian cake after her mother's peculiar method of easy manufacture, in which she could vouch for as possessing a richness, and, if rightly prepared, a delicacy unequaled by any other mode of breakfast cake. Hepzibah gladly assenting, the kitchen was soon the scene of savory preparation. Perchance, amid their proper element of smoke which eddied forth from the ill-constructed chimney, the ghosts of departed cookmaids looked wonderingly on, or peeped down the great breadth of the flue, despising the simplicity of the projected meal, yet ineffectually pining to thrust their shadowy hands into each inchoate dish. The half-starved rats, at any rate, stole visibly out of their hiding places, and sat on their hind legs, snuffing the funny atmosphere, and wistfully awaiting an opportunity to nibble. Hepzibah had no natural turn for cookery, and, to say the truth, had fairly incurred her present meagerness by often choosing to go without her dinner rather than be attendant on the rotation of the spit or ebullition of the pot. Her zeal over the fire, therefore, was quite an heroic test of sentiment. It was touching and positively worthy of tears if Phoebe, the only spectator, except the rats and ghosts aforesaid, had not been better employed than in shedding them to see her rake out of a bed of fresh and glowing coals and proceed to broil the mackerel. Her usually pale cheeks were all ablaze with heat and hurry. She watched the fish with as much tender care and minuteness of attention as if, we know not how to express it otherwise, as if her own heart were on the gridiron and her immortal happiness were involved in its being done precisely to a turn. Life within doors has few pleasanter prospects than a neatly arranged and well-provisioned breakfast table. We come to it freshly in the dewy youth of the day, and when our spiritual and sensual elements are in better accord than at a later period, so that the material delights of the morning meal are capable of being fully enjoyed without any very grievous reproaches, whether gastric or conscientious, or yielding even a trifle over much to the animal deportment of our nature. The thoughts, too, that run around the ring of familiar guests have a piquancy and mirthfulness and oftentimes a vivid truth which more rarely find their way into the elaborate intercourse of dinner. Hepzibah's small and ancient table, supported on its slender and graceful legs, and covered with a cloth of the richest damask, looked worthy to be the scene and centre of one of the cheerfulest of parties. The vapour of the broiled fish arose like incense from the shrine of a barbarian idol. 
While the fragrance of the mocha might have gratified the nostrils of a tutelary lar or whatever power has scope over a modern breakfast table. Phoebe's Indian cakes were the sweetest offering of all in their you befitting the rustic altars of the innocent and golden age, or so brightly yellow were they, resembling some of the bread which was changed to glistening gold when Midas tried to eat it. The butter must not be forgotten, butter which Phoebe herself had churned in her own rural home and brought it to her cousin as a propitiatory gift, smelling of clover blossoms and diffusing the charm of pastoral scenery through the dark-paneled parlor. All this, with the quaint gorgeousness of the old china cups and saucers and the crested spoons and a silver cream jug, Hepzibah's only other article of plate and shaped like the rudest porringer, set out aboard at which the state list of old colonial pension guests need not have scorned to take his place. But the Puritan's face scowled down out of the picture as if nothing on the table pleased his appetite. By way of contributing what grace she could, Phoebe gathered some roses and a few other flowers, possessing either scent or beauty, and arranged them in a glass pitcher, which, having long ago lost its handle, was so much the fitter for a flower vase. The early sunshine, as fresh as that which peeped into Eve's bower while she and Adam sat at the breakfast there, came twinkling through the branches of the pear tree and fell quite across the table. All was now ready. There were chairs and plates for three, a chair and plate for Hepzibah, the same for Phoebe, but what other guest did her cousin look for? Throughout this preparation there had been a constant tremor in Hepzibah's frame, an agitation so powerful that Phoebe could see the quivering of her gaunt shadow as thrown by the firelight on the kitchen wall or by the sunshine on the parlor floor. Its manifestations were so various and agreed so little with one another that the girl knew not what to make of it. Sometimes it seemed an ecstasy of delight and happiness. At such moments Hepzibah would fling out her arms and enfold Phoebe in them and kiss her cheek as tenderly as ever her mother had. She appeared to do so by an inevitable impulse, and as if her bosom were oppressed with tenderness, of which she must needs pour out a little in order to gain breathing room. The next moment, without any visible cause for the change, her unwanted joy shrank back, appalled, as it were, and clothed itself in mourning, or it ran and hid itself, so to speak, in the dungeon of her heart, where it had long lain chained, while a cold spectral sorrow took the place of the imprisoned joy that was afraid to be enfranchised, a sorrow as black as that was bright. She often broke into a little nervous, hysteric laugh, more touching than any tears could be, and forthwith, as if to try which was the most touching, a gust of tears would follow, or perhaps the laughter and tears came both at once, and surrounded our poor Hepzibah in a moral sense with a kind of pale, dim rainbow. Towards Phoebe, as we have said, she was affectionate, far tenderer than ever before in their brief acquaintance, except for that one kiss on the preceding night. Yet, with a continually recurring pettishness and irritability, she would speak sharply to her, then, throwing aside all the starched reserve of her ordinary manner, ask pardon, and the next instant renew the just forgiven injury. At last, when their mutual labor was all finished, she took Phoebe's hand in her own trembling one. "'Bear with me, my dear child,' she cried, "'for truly my heart is full to the brim. "'Bear with me, for I love you, Phoebe, "'though I speak so roughly. "'Think nothing of it, dearest child, by and by. "'I shall be kind and only kind.' "'My dearest cousin, cannot you tell me what has happened?' "'asked Phoebe with a sunny and tearful sympathy. "'What is it that moves you so?' "'Hush! Hush! He is coming!' "'whispered Hepzibah, hastily wiping her eyes. "'Let him see you first, Phoebe, for you are young and rosy "'and cannot help letting a smile break out, whether or no. "'He always liked bright faces, and mine is old now, "'and the tears are hardly dry on it. "'He never could abide tears. "'There, draw the curtain a little, "'so that the shadow may fall across his side of the table. "'But let there be a good deal of sunshine, too, "'for he never was fond of gloom.' "'As some people are. "'He has had but little sunshine in his life. "'Poor Clifford! "'And oh, what a black shadow! "'Poor, poor Clifford!' "'Thus, murmuring in an undertone, "'as if speaking rather to her own heart than to Phoebe, "'the old gentlewoman stepped on tiptoe about the room, "'making such arrangements as suggested themselves at the crisis. "'Meanwhile, there was a step in the passageway above stairs.' 
Phoebe recognized it as the same which had passed upward as through her dream in the night time. The approaching guest, whoever it might be, appeared to pause at the head of the staircase. He paused twice or thrice in the descent. He paused again at the foot. Each time the delay seemed to be without purpose, but rather from a forgetfulness of the purpose which had set him in motion, or as if the person's feet came involuntarily to a standstill because the motive power was too feeble to sustain his progress. Finally, he made a long pause at the threshold of the parlor. He took hold of the knob of the door, then loosened his grasp without opening it. Hepzibah, her hands convulsively clasped, stood gazing at the entrance. "'Dear Cousin Hepzibah, pray don't look so,' said Phoebe, trembling, for her cousin's emotion and this mysteriously reluctant step made her feel as if a ghost were coming into the room. "'You really frighten me. Is something awful going to happen?' "'Hush!' whispered Hepzibah. "'Be cheerful. Whatever may happen, be nothing but cheerful.' The final pause at the threshold proved so long that Hepzibah, unable to endure the suspense, rushed forward, threw open the door, and led in the stranger by the hand. At the first glance, Phoebe saw an elderly personage in an old-fashioned dressing gown of faded mask and wearing his gray or almost white hair of an unusual length. It quite overshadowed his forehead, except when he thrust it back and stared vaguely about the room. After a very brief inspection of his face, it was easy to conceive that his footstep must necessarily be such as one as that which slowly, and with as indefinite an aim as a child's first journey across a floor, had just brought him hitherward. Yet there were no tokens that his physical strength might not have sufficed for a free and determined gait. It was the spirit of the man that could not walk. The expression of his countenance, while notwithstanding it had the light of reason in it, seemed to waver and glimmer and nearly to die away, and feebly to recover itself again. It was like a flame which we see twinkling among half-extinguished embers. We gaze at it more intently than if it were a positive blaze gushing vividly upward, more intently but with a certain impatience, as if it ought to either kindle itself into satisfactory splendor or be at once extinguished. For an instant after entering the room, the guest stood still, retaining Hepzibah's hand instinctively as a child does that of the grown person who guides it. He saw Phoebe, however, and caught an illumination from her youthful and pleasant aspect, which indeed threw a cheerfulness about the parlor, like the circle of reflected brilliancy around the glass vase of flowers that was standing in the sunshine. He made a salutation, or, to speak near the truth, an ill-defined abortive attempt at courtesy. Imperfect as it was, however, it conveyed an idea or at least gave a hint of indescribable grace, such as no practiced art of external manners could have attained. It was too slight to seize upon at that instant, yet, as recollected afterwards, seemed to transfigure the whole man. "'Dear Clifford,' said Hepzibah, in the tone with which one soothes a wayward infant, "'this is our cousin Phoebe, little Phoebe Pynchon, Arthur's only child, you know.' "'She has come from the country to stay with us for a while, "'for our old house has grown to be very lonely now.' "'Phoebe. "'Phoebe. Pynchon. "'Phoebe,' repeated the guest, "'with a strange, sluggish, ill-defined utterance. "'Arthur's child. Ah. "'Ah, I forget. "'No matter, she is very welcome. "'Come.' "'Dear Clifford, take this chair,' said Hepzibah, leading him to his place. "'Pray, Phoebe, lower the curtain a very little more. "'Now, let us begin breakfast.' "'The guest seated himself in the place assigned him and looked strangely around. "'He was evidently trying to grapple with the present scene "'and bring it home to his mind with a more satisfactory distinctness. He desired to be certain, at least, that he was here, in the low, studded, cross-beamed, oaken-paneled parlor, and not in some other spot which had stereotyped itself into his senses. But the effort was too great to be sustained with more than a fragmentary success. Continually, as we may express it, he faded away out of his place, or, in other words, 
His mind and consciousness took their departure, leaving his wasted, gray, and melancholy figure, a substantial emptiness, a material ghost, to occupy his seat at table. Again, after a blank moment, there would be a flickering taper gleam in his eyeballs. It betokened that his spiritual part had returned and was doing its best to kindle the heart's household fire and light up intellectual lamps in the dark and ruinous mansion where it was doomed to be a forlorn inhabitant. At one of these moments of less torpid yet still imperfect animation, Phoebe became convinced of what she had at first rejected as too extravagant and startling an idea. She saw that the person before her must have been the original of the beautiful miniature in her cousin Hepzibah's possession. Indeed, with a feminine eye for costume, she had at once identified the damask dressing gown which enveloped him as the same in figure, material, and fashion with that so elaborately represented in the picture. This old, faded garment, with all its pristine brilliancy extinct, seemed in some indescribable way to translate the wearer's untold misfortune and make it perceptible to the beholder's eye. It was the better to be discerned by this exterior type how worn and old were the soul's more immediate garments, that form and countenance, the beauty and grace of which had almost transcended the skill of the most exquisite of artists. It could the more adequately be known that the soul of the man must have suffered some miserable wrong from its earthly experience. There he seemed to sit, with a dim veil of decay and ruin betwixt him and the world, but through which at flitting intervals might be caught the same expression, so refined, so softly imaginative, which Malbone, venturing a happy touch with suspended breath, had imparted to the miniature. There had been something so innately characteristic in this look, that all the dusky years and the burthen of unfit calamity which had fallen upon him did not suffice utterly to destroy it. Hepzibah had now poured out a cup of deliciously fragrant coffee and presented it to her guest. As his eyes met hers, he seemed bewildered and disquieted. "'Is this you, Hepzibah?' he murmured sadly, then more apart and perhaps unconscious than he was overheard. "'How changed! How changed! And is she angry with us? Why does she bend her brow so?' Poor Hepzibah. It was that wretched scowl which time and her near-sightedness and the fret of inward discomfort had rendered so habitual that any vehemence of mood invariably evoked it. But, at the indistinct manner of his words, her whole face grew tender, and even lovely with sorrowful affection. The harshness of her features disappeared, as it were, behind the warm and misty glow. Angry, she repeated, "'Angry with you, Clifford?' "'Her tone, as she uttered the exclamation, "'had a plaintive and really exquisite melody thrilling through it, "'yet without subduing a certain something "'which an obtuse auditor might still have mistaken for asperity. "'It was as if some transcendent musician "'should draw a soul-thrilling sweetness out of a cracked instrument "'which makes its physical imperfection heard in the midst of ethereal harmony. "'So deep was the sensibility that found an organ in Hepzibah's voice. "'There is nothing but love here, Clifford,' she added. "'Nothing but love. You are at home.' "'The guest responded to her tone by a smile "'which did not half light up his face. "'Feeble as it was, however, and gone in a moment,' It had a charm of wonderful beauty. It was followed by a, a coarser expression, or one that had the effect of coarseness on the fine mold and outline of his countenance, because there was nothing intellectual to temper it. It was a look of appetite. He ate food with what might be termed almost veracity, and seemed to forget himself, Hepzibah, the young girl, and everything else around him, in the sensual enjoyment which the bountifully spread table afforded. In his natural system, though high-wrought and delicately refined, a sensibility to the delights of the palate was probably inherent. It would have been kept in check, however, and even converted into an accomplishment and one of the thousand modes of intellectual culture, had his more ethereal characteristics retained their vigor. But as it existed now, the effect was painful and made Phoebe droop her eyes. In a little while, the guest became sensible of the fragrance of the yet untasted coffee. He quaffed it eagerly, 
The subtle essence acted on him like a charmed draft and caused the opaque substance of his animal being to grow transparent, or at least translucent, so that a spiritual gleam was transmitted through it with a clearer luster than hitherto. More! More! he cried with nervous haste in his utterance, as if anxious to retain his grasp of what sought to escape him. This is what I need. G give me more. Under this delicate and powerful influence, he sat more erect and looked out from his eyes with a glance that took note of what it rested on. It was not so much that his expression grew more intellectual. This, though it had its share, was not the most peculiar effect. Neither was what we call the moral nature so forcibly awakened as to present itself in remarkable prominence. But a certain fine temper of being was now not brought out in full relief, but changeably and imperfectly betrayed, of which it was the function to deal with all beautiful and enjoyable things. In a character where it should exist as the chief attribute, it would bestow on its possessor an exquisite taste and an enviable susceptibility of happiness. Beauty would be his life. His aspirations would all tend toward it, and, allowing his frame and physical organs to be in consonance, his own developments would likewise be beautiful. Such a man should have nothing to do with sorrow, nothing with strife, nothing with the martyrdom which, in an infinite variety of shapes, awaits those who have the heart and will and conscience to fight a battle with the world. To these heroic tempers such martyrdom is the richest mead in the world's gift." To the individual before us, it could only be a grief intense in due proportion with the severity of the infliction. He had no right to be a martyr, and beholding him so fit to be happy, and so feeble for all other purposes, a generous, strong, and noble spirit would, methinks, have been ready to sacrifice what little enjoyment it might have planned for itself. It would have flung down the hopes, so paltry in its regard, if thereby the wintry blasts of our rude sphere might come tempered to such a man." Not to speak it harshly or scornfully, it seemed Clifford's nature to be a Sybarite. It was perceptible, even there in the dark old parlor, in the inevitable polarity with which his eyes were attracted towards the quivering play of sunbeams through the shadowy foliage. It was seen in his appreciating notice of the vase of flowers, the scent of which he inhaled with a zest almost peculiar to a physical organization so refined that spiritual ingredients are molded in with it. It was betrayed in the unconscious smile with which he regarded Phoebe, whose fresh and maidenly figure was both sunshine and flowers, their essence in a prettier and more agreeable mode of manifestation. Not less evident was this love and necessity for the beautiful in the instinctive caution with which, even so soon, his eyes turned away from his hostess and wandered to any quarter rather than come back. It was Hepzibah's misfortune, not Clifford's fault. How could she... So yellow as she was, so wrinkled, so sad of me in with that odd uncouthness of a turban on her head and that most perverse of scowls contorting her brow, how could he love to gaze at her? But did he owe her no affection for so much as she had silently given? He owed her nothing. A nature like Clifford's can contract no debts of that kind. It is, we say it without censure, nor in diminution of the claim which it indefeasibly possesses on beings of another mold, it is always selfish in its essence, and we must give it leave to be so, and heap up our heroic and disinterested love upon it so much the more without a recompense. Poor Hepzibah knew this truth, or at least acted on the instinct of it. So long estranged from what was lovely as Clifford had been, she rejoiced, rejoiced, though with a present sigh and a secret purpose, to shed tears in her own chamber, that he had brighter objects now before his eyes than her aged and uncomely features. They never possessed a charm, and if they had, the canker of her grief for him would long since have destroyed it. The guest leaned back in his chair. Mingled in his countenance with a dreamy delight, there was a troubled look of effort and unrest. He was seeking to make himself more fully sensible of the scene around him, or perhaps dreading it to be a dream or a play of imagination, was vexing the fair moment with a struggle for some added brilliancy and more durable illusion. "'How pleasant! How delightful!' he murmured, but not as if addressing anyone. "'Will it last? How balmy the atmosphere through that open window!' "'An open window! How beautiful that play of sunshine! "'Those flowers! Oh, how very fragrant that 
young girl's face, how cheerful, how blooming. A flower with the dew on it and sunbeams in the dewdrops. Oh, uh, oh, oh, this must be all a dream. A dream. A dream. But it has quite hidden the four stone walls. Then his face darkened, as if the shadow of a cavern or a dungeon had come over it. There was no more light in its expression than might have come through the iron grates of a prison window. Still, lessening, too, as if he were sinking further into the depths. Phoebe, being of that quickness and activity of temperament that she seldom long refrained from taking a part, and generally a good one in what was going forward, now felt herself moved to address the stranger. "'Here is a new kind of rose which I found this morning in the garden,' said she, choosing a small crimson one from among the flowers in the vase. "'There will be but five or six on the bush this season.' This is the most perfect of them all, not a speck of blight or mildew in it. And how sweet it is. Sweet like no other rose. One can never forget that scent. Oh, let me see. Let me hold it, cried the guest, eagerly seizing the flower, which, by the spell peculiar to remembered odors, brought innumerable associations along with the fragrance that it exhaled. Thank you. Oh, this has done me good. Uh, I remember how I used to prize this flower long ago, I, I suppose, very long ago. Or, or was it only yesterday? Oh, it makes me feel young again. Am I young? Either this remembrance is singularly distinct or this consciousness strangely dim. But how kind of this fair young girl. Thank you. Thank you. The favorable excitement derived from this little crimson rose afforded Clifford the brightest moment which he enjoyed at the breakfast table. It might have lasted longer, but that his eyes happened soon afterwards to rest on the face of the old Puritan who, out of his dingy frame and lusterless canvas, was looking down on the scene like a ghost and a most ill-tempered and ungenial one. The guest made an impatient gesture of the hand and addressed Hepzibah with what might easily be recognized as the licensed irritability of a petted member of the family. Hepzibah! Hepzibah! cried he, with no little force and distinctness. Why do you keep that odious picture on the wall? Yes, yes, that is precisely your taste. I have told you a thousand times that it was the evil genius of the house. My evil genius particularly. "'Take it down, at once.' "'Dear Clifford,' said Hepzibah sadly, "'you know it cannot be.' "'Then, at, at all events,' continued he, "'still speaking with some energy, "'pray cover it with a crimson curtain "'broad enough to hang in folds "'and with a gold border and tassels. "'I cannot bear it. "'It must not stare me in the face.' "'Yes, dear Clifford, "'the picture shall be covered,' "'said Hepzibah soothingly.' Uh, "'There is a, a crimson curtain in a trunk above stairs, a, "'a little faded and moth-eaten, I'm afraid, "'but Phoebe and I will do wonders with it. "'This very day, remember,' said he, "'and then added in a low, self-communing voice, "'Why should we live in this dismal house at all? "'Why not go to the south of France, uh, to Italy, "'Paris, Naples, Venice, Rome, Hepzibah? "'We'll say we have not the means, oh, a droll idea that.' He smiled to himself and threw a glance of fine, sarcastic meaning towards Hepzibah. But the several moods of feeling, faintly as they were marked, through which he had passed, occurring in so brief an interval of time, had evidently wearied the stranger. He was probably accustomed to a sad monotony of life, not so much flowing in a stream, however sluggish, as stagnating in a pool around his feet. A slumberous veil diffused itself over his countenance and had an effect, morally speaking, on its naturally delicate and elegant outline, like that which a brooding mist, with no sunshine in it, throws over the features of a landscape. He appeared to become grosser, almost cloddish, if aught of interest or beauty, even ruined beauty, had heretofore been visible in this man, the beholder might now begin to doubt it, and to accuse his own imagination of deluding him with whatever grace had flickered over that visage, and whatever exquisite luster had gleamed in those filmy eyes. Before he had quite sunken away, however, 
the sharp and peevish tinkle of the shop bell made itself audible. Striking most disagreeably on Clifford's auditory organs and the characteristic sensibility of his nerves, it caused him to start upright out of the chair. "'Good heavens, Hepzibah! What horrible disturbance have we now in the house?' cried he, wreaking his resentful impatience as a matter of course and a custom of old on the one person in the world that loved him. "'I have never heard such a hateful clamor. Why do you permit it? In the name of all dissonance, what can it be?' It was very remarkable into what prominent relief, even as if a dim picture should leap suddenly from its canvas, Clifford's character was thrown by this apparently trifling annoyance. The secret was that an individual of his temper can always be pricked more acutely through his sense of the beautiful and harmonious than through his heart. It is even possible, for similar cases have often happened, that if Clifford in his foregoing life had enjoyed the means of cultivating his taste to its utmost perfectibility, that subtle attribute might before this period have completely eaten out or filed away his affections. Shall we venture to pronounce, therefore, that his long and black calamity may not have had a redeeming drop of mercy at the bottom? Dear Clifford, I wish I could keep the sound from your ears, said Hepzibah patiently, but reddening with a painful suffusion of shame. It is very disagreeable even to me, but do you know, Clifford, I... "'Have something to tell you. "'This ugly noise. "'Pray run, Phoebe, and see who is there. "'This naughty little tinkle is nothing but our shop bell.' "'Shop bell?' repeated Clifford, with a bewildered stare. "'Yes, our shop bell,' said Hepzibah, "'a certain natural dignity mingled with deep emotion, "'now asserting itself in her manner. "'For you must know, dearest Clifford, that we are very poor.' and there was no other resource but either to accept assistance from a hand that I would push aside, and so would you, were it to offer bread when we were dying for it, no help save from him, or else to earn our subsistence with my own hands. Alone I might have been content to starve, but you were to be given back to me. Do you think then, dear Clifford, added she with a wretched smile, that I have brought an irretrievable disgrace on the old house by opening a little shop in the front gable. Our great-great-grandfather did the same when there was far less need. Are you ashamed of me? Shame? Disgrace? Do you speak these words to me, Hepzibah? said Clifford. Not angrily, however, for when a man's spirit has been thoroughly crushed, he may be peevish at small offences but never resentful of great ones. So he spoke with only a grieved emotion. It was not kind to say so, Hepzibah. What shame can befall me now? And then the unnerved man, he that had been born for enjoyment but had met a doom so very wretched, burst into a woman's passion of tears. It was but of brief continuance, however, soon leaving him in a quiescent and, to judge by his countenance, not an uncomfortable state. From this mood, too, he partially rallied for an instant and looked at Hepzibah with a smile, the keen, half-derisory purport of which was a puzzle to her. "'Are we so very poor, Hepzibah?' said he. Finally, his chair being deep and softly cushioned, Clifford fell asleep, hearing the more regular rise and fall of his breath, which, however, even then, instead of being strong and full, had a feeble kind of tremor corresponding with the lack of vigor in his character. Hearing these tokens of settled slumber, Hepzibah seized the opportunity to peruse his face more attentively than she had yet dared to do. Her heart melted away in tears. Her profoundest spirit sent forth a moaning voice, low, gentle, but inexpressibly sad. In this depth of grief and pity, she felt that there was no irreverence in gazing at his altered, aged, faded, ruined face. But no sooner was she a little relieved than her conscience smote her for gazing curiously at him now that he was so changed, and turning hastily away, Hepzibah let down the curtain over the sunny window and left Clifford to slumber there. The end of chapter 7. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the web at fcit.usf.edu.